Welcome back to part three of the Rocket League botting tutorial. If you are just joining us, there's a link in the description to the full series to get you caught up. Hey, it's Ben, and this is Learn Code by Gaming. In this video, we're going to be addressing the problems that popped up with our bot when all the large boosts were taken. And after we get that cleaned up, I'm going to show you how we can make our bot switch between stealing boost and chasing the ball, depending on the in-game situation. That will serve as our first steps towards making a more sophisticated bot that's capable of making intelligent decisions. By the end of this video, you should have a pretty good handle on how you can piece together different behaviors, maneuvers, and bits of logic that are individually rather simple, but when brought together, can result in a pretty impressive, smart artificial intelligence. That way, you'll be able to go forth from here and build the bot of your dreams to impress all your friends, family, and potential employers. So no more delay, let's get back to the code. So since the last video, I went ahead and added a few more comments to the code for you guys. So when you check that out in GitHub, it'll be a little more helpful for you. Uh, but otherwise, we're picking up right where we left off. So the problem we were seeing last time is the get nearest boost function. When all of the large boosts are taken, it's returning none. And that's causing issues when we try to do math with the target location, which we expect to be a vector, when it's actually none. And it causes all these errors to output in our console. So the way I want to address this is, if we can't find any large boosts, let's go ahead and find a smaller boost to go grab. And if somehow all of the large boosts and all of the small boosts are taken, let's just have our bot drive to the middle of the field. That way, our get nearest boost function is always returning some sort of location. So inside our get nearest boost function, let's eliminate all possibility for this function to return none. So I'll just take that out of there. And then, Let's do the center of the field fix first. So if we get to this point in the function and nearest boost location uh, is still none. Uh, let's set the nearest boost location to the middle of the field, which will just be a vector three. Um, and you can give it uh, just an X, a Y, and a Z to start with. It has a constructor for that. So zero, 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 that's going to be the center of the field. Uh, so the other thing we want to do is go grab the small boosts if there are any large boosts available. And really, to do that, it's going to be just like how we found the large boosts. We just want to eliminate this, you know, if check for only looking at the large boosts. So the quickest and simplest way to do that is going to be just a copy that entire for loop, repaste it, and just get rid of the check for the large boosts. And of course, we only want to do this if we weren't able to find a large boost. So only do that if nearest boost location is none. And that'll work. There's uh, nothing too wrong with this code. It's functional. Uh, but there are a few issues with it. Uh, first of all, you'll notice we have two pieces of code here, this for loop block, and then the one I just created. Uh, they're very similar. Uh, so when you're programming, you don't want to repeat yourself. There's a principle called dry, which stands for don't repeat yourself. So this definitely violates that principle. And in addition to that, uh, we're looping through all of the boosts in the game twice with this code. Uh, and that's a little inefficient. So this could definitely be made better in a couple different ways. To address the dry problem, we could write a function to do this loop. And then maybe have a parameter if we want to check for the is full boost or not. But of course, that doesn't fix our problem with looping over all the data twice. Uh, so I'll leave that up to you as an exercise to improve this code. Uh, but for now, I'll just leave it like this. And this is the quick and dirty way to get the behavior we want. I'll make a note. We only want to check for small boost if we can't find a large boost. And then let's go ahead and give this code a try. All right, I've got 3v3 boost hogs running here. Let's see what happens when they take all the boosts. And there we are seeing some of these bots now targeting the smaller boosts, which is just what we want. And I don't think we'll ever end up in a situation where all of the large and small boosts are gone to see it go to the middle of the field. So to test that behavior, we'd want to uh, comment out the small boost code to make sure it does go to the center of the field like we think. Another optimization we could make in our get nearest boost function is we can look at the timer for the boosts that have been taken but are about to respawn. So remember, we have that information if we look at the, uh, the game boosts that's actually going to be packet.gameBoost. So inside the packet information, the uh, data we get about the boost, it includes a timer value that will tell us how long we have before the next boost will spawn. So I'll leave this as a, another exercise for you. If you want to make this optimization, you can actually have your bot go to a boost that's a bot to respawn instead of going to one of the smaller boosts or going to the center of the map. 
So now that we've got that issue sorted out, the next thing I wanted to talk about was how we can introduce some behavior logic into our bot. So one of the issues with our bot you may have noticed is since we're only going after boost, it'll never ever go after the ball. And this is particularly troublesome at the beginning of the game during the kickoff. So like here we have our six bots running and you'll notice the ball is still exactly where it was at the uh, start of the kickoff. And so I think it might be a good idea to have our bots just during kickoff uh, go for the ball instead of going for boost immediately. So to do that, let's head back over to our code and then go to our bot class. Let's create another class variable. We'll call it has first touch happened yet. And of course, when we first start our bot, the first touch hasn't happened yet on the ball. And then the idea will be inside our, let's call this behavior logic. In our behavior logic, if the first touch has already happened, then we want to continue going after the nearest boost. But if the first touch hasn't happened yet, uh, let's go to the ball instead. So that'll be if not self dot first touch has happened yet. So if it hasn't happened yet, we want the target location to be the ball location. Else, let's continue to use the nearest boost location. And of course, if we were to run this now, we're not changing the value of has first touched happened yet um, at any point. So this is going to always be false. So if you were to run it now, it would continue to hit this. This would end up being a true statement and would run the ball location as our target location. So it would just ball chase at this point. So we need some way to detect if the ball has been touched yet. Um, so let's use the location of the ball when it moves off of the 0, 0, 0 position. We'll use that to let us know that yes, the ball's been touched by somebody and we can continue on with our grabbing boost code instead of going after the ball. So what that logic will look like is we'll check if the ball location is not equal to vector three, zero, zero, zero. That means the ball has been moved off of the center position. So a, a first touch has happened. So let's flip that variable over. Okay, so now it'll be true when that happens. And if you were to run this code, you'd notice a small issue with it. The ball location is actually from the center of the ball, which is slightly off of the bottom of the field. Uh, so our Z coordinate is actually not going to be zero here, uh, but we can fix that by using the flat uh, function on vector three, and that'll give us the Z coordinate is always zero. And I'll show you what that looks like inside the utilities. Go to vector, and here's our flat function. You can see it just gives us the x and the y, and it sets the z always equal to zero. So you can imagine this is the position of the ball if we were looking top down and just wanted the x, y position from that view. So if we run this code, we'll need to start a new match. That way we start again at the beginning of the game, and our has the ball been touched yet is equal to false right now. And so all of our bots should go right towards the ball and they don't. What did I mess up? Okay, so the reason our not equals check is failing here is because the VEC3 class is not set up to handle equality. If you take a look at that uh, vector class definition in the VEC class, you can see down here there's get item, there's add, subtract, all of that good math stuff, but there isn't any equals or not equals capabilities. So let's go ahead and add that. So this is Python specific. If you do two underscores and EQ, if that's your function name, uh, this will do the equality check for you when you use this class, comparing it to another class. So we gotta give it self, and it's really gonna look just like this. I'll just copy that. So self will be the item on the left of your equal signs, and then other will be the item on the right of your equal sign. And then we're going to be returning a boolean actually. So I'll just get rid of that return entirely. So two vector threes are equal to each other when their x and their y and their z are all equal to each other. So I'll return, I'll put this in parentheses to stay organized. So when self.x is equal to other.x and self.y is equal to other.y and self.z 
is equal to other dot z. So this gives us the ability to use the double equal sign. And if we want to use the not equals, the name of that function should be ne for not equals with the uh, double underscores before and after. Copy this again. And then we can just reuse our equals definition here. So we'll return not self dot and we have to give it the, the other vector. So now that we have that in place, our not equals check between these two vectors here uh, should work correctly. So let's give it another try. Okay, so again, the behavior we expect here is the bots to go after the ball first. It looks like they all pointed at the ball. That's pretty fun. And now they're going after boosts. All right, so now we've got different behavior running uh, depending on if the ball's been touched yet or not. So one of the problems you'll notice with this code is it works great on the first kickoff, but if someone happens to score a goal, then on the next kickoff, the bot is still going to go after boost and not the ball. So we need to reset the has first touch happened yet uh, whenever a goal is scored. And also, if the game ends up in a tie and it goes into overtime, that's also another situation where we want to set the has first touch happened yet back to false. So the way we could do that is inside the game packet, there's a piece of information about if it's the kickoff pause or not. So it'll be if packet dot game info dot is kickoff pause. In this case, we want to set our has first touch happened yet back to false. And to know that is kickoff pause uh, value is available. Again, I was looking at the wiki article, the input and output data for RLBot and looking at the game tick packet and the sample packet. If you go down and look at the game info, you can see inside there is the is kickoff pause and it's just a boolean true false flag. So hopefully you're starting to see here how our bot can be composed of many different behaviors that are then stitched together based off of logic depending on what's going on inside the game. And to really drive that home, why don't we put the current mode that our bot is in in the corner of the screen. So say behavior mode. And by default, let's say it's unknown. But if we're going after the ball, let's say we're in kickoff mode. And if we're going for the boost, say we're in boost steal mode. Then we'll go ahead and print that to our corner debug. So you can see here back inside the game in our corner debug, it now has current mode and boost steal for all six of our bots are currently in the boost steal mode. So I want to add just one more feature to our bot. I think it'd be cool if after our bot took like six boosts, if it just went after the ball for maybe five seconds and then it returned to boost stealing, I think that could create some more interesting behavior. So let's go ahead and see how we would code that up. So to do that, the first thing we need to do is count how many times or how many boosts that we've collected. So let's keep track of that in another class variable. Call it boosts collected. Start off at zero. And so inside the main game loop, let's add a function call that will keep track of how many boosts we've collected. So let's put it right in here. Update how many boosts our bot has collected. Let's make this another method on the class. Let's call it update boosts collected. And this function is definitely going to need the car. Because what I want to do is anytime the car goes from less than 100 boost up to 100 boost, we're going to consider that one boost collection. So let's copy what we want our function to look like. Scroll down, make sure your tabs are correct here and you're still inside your MyBot class. So now we're ready to write the logic for our update boosts collected function. And so inside this function, we want to mark when 100 boost has been reached. 
So if my car dot boost, I believe, let's check the game tick packet again. So inside the game cars, my car is going to be the car that we're talking about, and there's this boost value. And so when that reaches 100, that'll be full boost. So if that's greater than or equal to 100. Then we want to increment the boost collected by one. But of course, update boost collected is being called every tick. And currently, this logic would increase that boost collected number every tick that we are over 100 boosts. But we only want to do it when we switch from having less than that amount of boost to having 100 boost. So to do that, I'm going to make another class variable to keep track of if we've counted this current boost yet or not. So let's call it self.boostCounted. We'll set that to true once we've incremented the boost collected by one. And then when we fall below 100 boost, we'll say that the next boost, boost counted, hasn't happened yet. So we'll set that flag to false. And then of course we only want to increment this boost collected if boost counted hasn't happened yet. So if not boost counted, increment boost collected by one and then set that flag to mark that it has been counted. And then whenever a tick happens where our boost is dropped below 100 again, this boost counted flag will flip at the false. And of course, we haven't ever initialized this boost counted yet. So it's good practice to do that. Let's go back up to our initialization. Set the boost counted to false when the bot first runs. And let's go ahead and just output how many boosts we've collected to make sure that this is working properly. So I'm going to go down to the corner debug. Let's replace this, this first boost location thing I don't really think is relevant anymore. Boosts collected. And we're going to print out that number. I'm going to start a new match here just with a single boost hog so we can clearly see uh, that number update properly. Okay, I'm seeing this update boost collected it takes one argument, but we're given two. I bet we forgot that self parameter again. Yes, of course, because this is a class function, we need to have self as the first parameter. So I believe that's reloaded and it should be working correctly now. Let's continue the game. Okay, so boost collected is zero. <laughs> and he just scores a goal to start with. All right, he missed that time. So now we can see uh, the boost collected is going up every time he grabs one. That's at three now. Now it's at four, five. All right, so we are counting the boosts correctly. If we didn't do that check to make sure we didn't, you know, multiple times count boosts, then this number would be flying up to thousands by now. So now what we want to do is, after our boost collected has reached a certain threshold, we want to set a certain amount of time uh, to start chasing the ball instead of going after the boost. So what I think I'm going to do is here in the update boost collected function, if boost collected has crossed threshold, let's trigger our behavior logic to chase ball. So if self dot boost collected is greater than or equal to, we'll start with six. Then let's create another class variable, call it chase ball time. Set that equal to, let's say five seconds. And then let's flip our boost collected back to zero. So we restart our count. Boost collected equals zero. We set the boost count boost collected count. So let's go ahead and initialize this value. So we'll default it to zero. 
And in thinking about how to write this logic here, I'm going to have a, an else if statement here. So if the first touch hasn't happened yet, we're always going to go into kickoff mode. But now we want to check to see if we should go into this ball chasing mode. All right, so what do we want this logic here to look like? I think if the game time, the, the time on the clock inside the game, if that's within five seconds of when we reached our boost threshold, when we collected six boosts, if we're within that five seconds, we want to go chase the ball. If we're outside of it, then we want to continue to boost deal. So the first piece of information we need to write this logic is we need the current time inside the game. Let's go look to see how we get that. So we pack it dot game info. Let's use game time remaining. And game time remaining is going to be counting down, of course. So we want to use greater than if the time remaining is greater than uh, when we reach that threshold. So self dot what do we call the new variable up here chase ball time. So right now we just set this to five seconds. Of course, this isn't going to make any sense because the game time is ticking down from like 100 to 99 to 98. And chase ball time is just going to be 5. Why don't we change what this is? Chase ball, let's call this game time. So we'll make this the value when we cross the threshold. And so we want to subtract 5 seconds from that to get the time uh, during which we want to be chasing the ball. So I changed that value. Down here I'm just going to type pass for now. And that just indicates to Python that this is an empty part of our logic for the time being. Update that variable name. Inside update boost collected. This chase ball time. It's no longer going to be five. This is going to be the game time uh, when we reach this uh, six boost collected threshold. So to get that game time, we either need to pass in the packet. Let's just pass that in. Packet. So then this will be packet dot game info dot what was it? Game time remaining. Yeah, game time remaining. Let's just copy that. And of course, I added this new parameter that we are requiring. So update boost collected. Now it's the packet. Right here, packet. So now our logic should work anytime we're within this zone. It should enter this part of our if statement. So if this is the case, our behavior mode is now chase ball. And the target location is now the ball location. And let's see if this works. All right, so it's taking the kickoff again. Oh no, it's gonna score a goal. <laughs> So this isn't working well with one bot. Let me add two bots. Make them both boost hog. Okay, so we're seeing our bots here just continually chase the ball. And what that tells me is, is that it's always entering this else if statement. And I believe that's happening because this chase ball game time we are setting that off to zero to start with, and of course zero minus five, that's always gonna be a lot less than whatever the game time is remaining. So to fix that, let's just give this a high number, 99999. That should solve our problem. And you can see, even without resuming the game yet, our current mode has switched to boost deal. So now they'll go and grab our boosts. Let's watch the counts go up. Both at two, both at three, <laughs> they annihilated each other. All 
right, now we can see one is at three, one's at four. One just went to zero because he's going to now go after the ball. And then after five seconds, you can see he's back to boost dealing again. So that's perfect. That's what we expect our bots to be doing. And of course, we're seeing some of this overlapping text here on our boosts collected, since we do have two of our own bots running at the same time. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is our use of the five seconds here. And then also the in our boost collected, we're using six as our threshold. These are both good examples of constants in our, in our program. And when you're coding, it's a good idea to not hard code your constants like this, but instead to put them into constant variables. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll call this self that boost collected threshold. And you'll notice I put it in all caps. That's the convention for constants. So it's not required at all, but it will help you to remember when you're writing code that, that is a constant. And I'm going to define my constants right here below the class. So the boost threshold is six. Let's make another one. Ball chase time. Seems like a good name for it. Set that equal to five. And this helps keep your code a lot more organized. You know if you want to change any of these constants, which this is the sort of number that you would want to play around with. You know you can always find it here right at the top of your code. It also makes it more clear down when you're writing your code. Instead of having just five here, uh, by giving it a variable name, it's much more clear You know what this value is. You know, I think that this variable name could even be a little bit better. Instead of calling it ball chase time, let's call it ball chase duration. So now I want to see how our bot performs when it's lined up against some of these other bots. Let's grab, I like Beast from the East. We'll grab one of the Psionics bots to play with it. And I wonder if this Skybot, how that'll do with Boost Hog. Let's give this a try. Boost Hog on the orange team. You can see there it went after the ball. Oh man, these other bots are too good. Beast from the East. All right, this might give Boost Hog a chance to steal some boosts. All right, we're at three. At four. At five, six. Oh, I don't know if five seconds is a long enough time to get all the way to the ball. Oh, there he touched it. That's pretty cool. Back to boost stealing. He had to go all the way across the field there, but five seconds was just enough so he could get to the ball in time. All right, we're back up to four boosts. Oh, he's targeting the ball. Oh, he ran out of boost there. Not quite enough time to get all the way to it. Oh, that's pretty fun though. So I want to conclude here by taking a look at the Beast from the East source code. It's an open source bot. It's up here on GitHub. Um, so that gives us a chance to look through how this bot is structured. So its base botting file is going to be this beastbot.py file. And if you look through here, you can see that it's got its initialized agent, just like we do. It has its git output, which is the main game loop, just like we have. And you can see he's trying to keep this really small, so he's just gathering some of the data from the packet and organizing it. And then he is using his brain, he calls it, that's going to perform all of his logic for his bot. And then he's also doing the rendering for his debug output. And then if we go down to his use brain function, you can see it's just doing some basic logic. It looks like he has different choices of different behaviors to do. And then when he finds a good choice, uh, that's the behavior he's going to use. Let's go back up a directory. And you can see he has these two folders for maneuvers and behaviors. So maneuvers are going to be the more simple constructions of how to do a dodge, how to do a half flip. Uh, just some more advanced maneuvers you can do with your controller besides just going towards the ball or going towards the boost. You can even see that he has collect boost as a type of maneuver. 
And then if we go back up to behaviors, so behaviors are going to be more complicated than maneuvers, but they're going to be built out of the maneuvers. So you start with these simple maneuvers and together you can combine them to do different behaviors. And then in his brain logic, he's deciding which one of the behaviors he wants to use at a given time. So this is not unlike our code where we have the maneuver for going to a target location. And we are using this to perform a few different behaviors, which is going towards the ball during kickoff, or going to collect boost, or going towards the ball uh, after we've collected so many boosts. And we are using that logic of what behavior to run. We're checking for that inside of each game tick, uh, just like he is in his use brain function. So if you want to keep on working on your bot, and you want an example of how you can build up a more sophisticated artificial intelligence from smaller bits and pieces, I think the Beast from the East bot is a good place to go look and get some inspiration. So that's as far as I'm going to take you, but please don't stop here. There's so much more you can do, and I want to see all of you express yourself through code and build a bot that reflects you. Hopefully you've had fun with this, and you've learned a lot here, so keep a good thing going. Writing code like this, for yourself and having fun, is absolutely the best way to learn, and you'll be a master before you know it. If there's anything I can do to help you, let me know in the comments or send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. And if you haven't already, I appreciate the like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Stay keeps it alive. Turn up, there. Bounces into the corner. And a G's still around. Just in his death.